Okay, are we all right now? Yes, great. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> um, I'm Vice, um, Professor Judith Petz. I'm Vice Chancellor of the University, and it's, it's really lovely to see so many people here for the Lord Carradine uh, lecture. Uh, this is something, an event that we share with uh, Marjon University, so it's our turn this year. I'm very pleased that the Vice Chancellor for our Marjon is here as well. And it's always been a great privilege to, to be able to host this really important lecture series. The topic this evening, the United Nations, uh, is it now irrelevant? Uh, I, when I reflected on that title from our, our speaker, who will be introduced in a moment, it occurred to me that for a university like us that signs the UN Sustainable Development Goals Accord, and for many universities in the UK, and I chair all the universities in the UK in terms of sustainable development, the UN has had quite an important role to play. And that being maybe different to what she's about to say in the political space in which they operate and, and today. Uh, but the university um, is in the top 100 in the world in its performance in sustainable development. And we actually are able to give evidence in relation to SDG number two, which is about zero hunger. SDG number 11, which is about sustainable cities. 12, which is about responsible consumption. Um, 13 on climate action, 14 for life below water, and we were ranked first in the world for our action around life below water, and uh, uh, 17 on partnerships, which of course is at the heart of the way that the UN operates. So for us to be able to think about the UN in that space is really important. Our, our Karen this evening, our lecturer, has been also thankfully, talking to our students and on our international relations master's course at the university. Um, we have over 50 students at the moment at master's level, both online and face to face, covering all dimensions of international relations, including the important role of the EU, which is a specialism of Karen's, but also the uh, United Nations. So great thanks to her for just spending some time working with our students before we started this evening. Our students go on to careers in international relations in the UK civil service, in defence, in the NGOs, and in both public and private sector employers. And it's something that we're quite proud of in terms of the contribution that uh, postgraduate students can make. So I'm not going to see much more other than to uh, leave the introduction now uh, to someone else for our speaker. But very warm welcome. You've seen all the instructions about what happens if the fire alarm goes off, etc. Um, basically, head for the doors and someone will help. Um, please do remember to turn your phones off if you can, please, or put them onto silent. Uh, but thank you so much for joining us, and I'll hand over now uh, for an introduction to our speaker for this evening. Well, good evening, everyone, and I hope you can hear me clearly at the back. Um, I'm Judith McGregor, one of the trustees of the Lord Carradine Lecture Trust, and it's really my privilege this evening to introduce uh, Professor Karen Smith to you. Um, as a former diplomat um, and a former female diplomat, I've worked with Karen on her, one of her major interests, as well as the United Nations, the project on women in diplomacy, uh, being run through the LSE Ideas Project. And we even had the stimulating time of discussing a feminist foreign policy not so long ago. However, tonight it's the United Nations. So let me just formally say that Professor Karen Smith is a professor of international relations at the LSE. Until recently, she was the head of department. Her main area of research is the international relations of the European Union. And in doing that, she has examined the EU's pursuit of ethical foreign policy goals, such as promoting human rights and democracy, and policy making within European states on issues such as genocide. So she has certainly covered some very complex and most important subjects in international relations. Karen has also published extensively on EU United Nations ships, and more recently on the role of other political and regional groupings inside UN diplomacy. And in 2020, she co-edited a book called Group Politics in UN Multilateralism, 
and that won the Academic Council on the UN Systems by, la by Biennial Award for the Best Book on the United Nations. She is currently, as I said, investigating also the role of women in foreign policy making and leading the Women in Diplomacy Project at LSE Ideas. There is surely no better or re more relevant time at this moment with two fierce international conflicts taking the headlines in the United Nations and also um, in the Ukraine and Israel was what I had in mind. And this is surely a very important time for examining the question of the relevance of the United Nations and the United Nations system. And I think there is no better person or student of multilateral institutions to guide us and to give us her insights than Professor Smith. Because not only have you very clearly examined the structures, the history, the context, but I know you've also looked at the people-to-people -people relationships, the emotions that guide these relationships. They are, after all, people working in a very complex endeavor. I am therefore delighted to invite you, Karen, to address us on the theme, is the United Nations relevant now? Thank you. Oh, wow. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Judith, uh, for this very kind introduction. And thank you to the Vice Chancellor, of course, for hosting uh, this lecture. And many thanks to the, the Lord Carradine Trust and Simon Hill for inviting me to give the lecture in the first place. It's a great honor uh, for me to do so. And I'm pleased that my lecture picks up on a central focus of Lord Carradine's career as the UK's permanent representative to the UN from 1964 to 1970. So the question I'm going to address in my lecture is about the continuing or not relevance of the United Nations. And the short answer for those of you who always like to skip to the end of books, where you know who you are, uh, it is uh, still relevant is what I'm going to uh, argue. Now, every September, the UN General Assembly in New York is the site of the so-called high level week a week in which heads of state or government, or sometimes their ministers, address the General Assembly. It attracts a lot of media attention, and it's a highlight of the diplomatic calendar in New York, though not necessarily of New Yorkers who must cope with the huge influx of security details, journalists, and so on for the week. At the UN General Assembly High Level Week in September 2023, there were some high-level absences. Only one of the P5 uh, leaders showed up. So the P5 are the permanent five members of the UN Security Council, US, France, UK, Russia, and China. US President Biden did address the General Assembly, but Rishi Sunak was the first UK Prime Minister in a decade not to attend. French President Emmanuel Macron also did not attend. The leaders of Russia and China did not show up either, but they usually do not do so, though both Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping did both attend in 2015, which was the 70th anniversary of the UN. Just as an aside, the US president is in fact a regular uh, speaker. Since the beginning of the Reagan administration in the early 1980s, the US president has always spoken at the high level week, even when the president is a less than enthusiastic supporter of the UN as of course several of them have been in recent memory. Now the absences generated considerable discussion about the supposed irrelevance of the UN. So this is just, I'm just gonna show you a sample of some of the angst that was uh, demonstrated by various think tanks and so on. So snubs and fragmentation were noted. Think tanks such as Chatham House and Carnegie Europe asked whether the UN was relevant or still fit for purpose. The absences were considered to be particularly unfortunate because this year the UN General Assembly has been focusing on the Sustainable Development Goals, which we've just heard about, and other issues of importance to developing countries. Other signs of the irrelevance of the UN include the recent inability of the UN Security Council to agree on resolutions regarding the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the Israeli-Hamas war, because they have been blocked by vetoes by either the US or Russia and China. 
To top it off, in June, UN peacekeepers were, uh, were asked to leave Mali by the newly installed military government there. There have, in fact, long been concerns about the future of UN peacekeeping in general, with no new multidimensional peacekeeping missions approved for a decade. For some observers, it seems that the great powers are instead focusing their diplomatic efforts and attention on smaller forums, such as the G7, the G20, or BRICS, which are potentially more efficient and easier for them to influence. However, concerns about the relevance of the UN are, arise almost every year. For example, in 2020, how to make it relevant again. In 2016, is the UN still relevant? In 2012, again, is the United Nations still relevant? And in fact, the UN arguably has only had a short heyday, of, uh, sort of the, the, the best influence that it ever had, in the immediate wake of the Cold War and the collapse of communism in the early 1990s, when the P5 could agree on much, including launching peacekeeping missions in what had been Cold War conflict zones. But the early 1990s stand out as an exception to constant questions about the UN's effectiveness and utility. During the Cold War, the P5 were normally at loggerheads. This is, of course, uh, Nikita Khrushchev, the Soviet leader, who may or may not have banged his shoe on his desk at the UN General Assembly in anger, but who always and often rather clashed with the United States at the United Nations. In the wake of the UN's heyday at the start of the 1990s, there were notable and spectacular failures of UN peacekeeping missions to protect civilians, as during the genocide in uh, Rwanda. Uh, and Romeo Dallaire was the head of the peacekeeping mission in Rwanda at the time and remains haunted by the UN's failures to protect people. NATO intervened against Serbia in Kosovo in 1999 without UN Security Council authorization, as would have normally been required by the UN Charter. And the US invaded Iraq uh, in 2003, also without UN Security Council approval, though the US Secretary of State, Colin Powell, did at least address the UN Security Council trying to present the need uh, for intervention preferably with UN agreement, but if not, the US indicated it would act unilaterally. All of these episodes sparked considerable concern about the future of the UN. However, the UN is also not the only international institution about which there have been repeated questions about relevance. In fact, even the G20, supposedly now the focus of great power diplomacy, has had the same question asked uh, of it. The same question has asked, been asked about ASEAN. The question has been asked about NATO virtually since 1989, I would add. And in fact, my good friend Natalie Tolchi recently uh, surmised that perhaps multilateralism uh, itself could be uh, broken. Now, by relevance, what do I mean? I mean by uh, really according to the dictionary definition, that is, important to someone or something related or connected to the matter at hand, appropriate, that there's confidence in it. It cannot be solely reduced to effectiveness, though of course the effectiveness of an institution could be considered critical to have confidence uh, in it. But it is not only about effectiveness. Now, it is entirely appropriate to ask hard questions about how well international institutions are performing including how relevant they seem in the current international context. But some of the continued questioning of the UN's relevance seems to reflect, some of it, Western angst about the West's relative loss of power and influence in a more complex, more difficult, more multipolar world. Now the argument that I'm gonna develop here tonight is that the UN is relevant to its member states despite all of the concern about absences at the 2023 high-level event. The UN is relevant to its member states because it is considered to be the primary, in fact, possibly even the only place where they seek collective legitimization. They, that is member states, therefore think the UN is important and as is an appropriate forum in which to debate global issues. 
And we should pay more attention to this particular aspect of the UN, because by doing so, we get a much better idea of what the so-called international community thinks. In fact, international community is almost always intended to mean the United Nations. We also get a better idea of the kind of persuasive arguments that are needed in order to bring international public opinion behind particular policy and normative positions. So let me unwrap this argument step by step. First of all, let's clarify what we mean by the UN. And this next uh, slide can look a little bit scary. <laughs> it's a lot of stuff that's involved uh, in the United uh, Nations. There's the United Nations. There's a huge number of committees and agencies and related bits and pieces of the UN. Um, so it's huge. The UN is extremely uh, large. And this could, you could describe this as sort of the first uh, UN. The UN also attracts much attention and lobbying from what is sometimes called the third UN, that is civil society groups, various and other uh, lobbying organizations, academics, and experts that revolve around all of the activity that is going on within these particular institutions. To simplify it a little bit, we can see the United Nations as a mirror it is mirroring geopolitical tensions. It can do nothing but, in fact, uh, mirror uh, uh, geopolitical, the state of geopolitics, the state of international politics. If the great powers, that is the P5, are divided, then the Security Council cannot function. So it's a mirror. It tells us basically what we are like outside of the UN. It's an actor in the sense that the UN has some limited capacity to act independently of its member states, and particularly the P5. For example, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres for, can act as a, the kind of conscience of the world, as when he raises alarms about uh, climate change, when he, for example, declaring that the world is no longer warming, it is burning, or when he speaks out on human rights abuses and so on. To some extent, that's the UN as an actor acting independently of whatever the Security Council or, or other institutions might uh, uh, agree. The UN is also an idea generator. Um, and this is just um, uh, and one of a number of publications that Thomas Rice and his collaborators have argued uh, this, this case. That, that if we look at some particularly important normative developments in, the, in, in international relations regarding, for example, human rights or responsibility to protect or peacekeeping itself, those have originated within uh, the United Nations. Finally, the UN is a forum. The UN's function as a forum is most visible in its intergovernmental institutions. The UN Security Council, with 15 member states, of whom five are permanent members and 10 are elected members. The UN General Assembly, which is composed of all of the members of the UN and meets in New York every autumn. And then, because this is my own interest, but it's also an intergovernmental institution, the Human Rights Council, uh, which is the UN's premier intergovernmental body devoted to the promotion and protection of human rights. It is based in Geneva, meets three times a year, and is composed of 47 states that are elected by the General Assembly. So my focus today is on these intergovernmental institutions and primarily, actually, the General Assembly and the Human Rights uh, Council. And as Katie Latikainen and I have argued, the UN should be understood as a political context in which global challenges are debated and addressed. And we understand politics to entail the attempt to influence others and to achieve particular goals. Now, what happens in the UNGA, the UN General Assembly, and the HRC, the Human Rights Council? Now, the General Assembly can and does debate any international uh, issue that is covered by the UN Charter, peace, security, development, human rights, and so on, and can make recommendations on such matters in the form of resolutions. With the Security Council blocked by vetoes, the General Assembly becomes even more important as a debating chamber. The General Assembly, for example, can hold emergency special sessions if the Security Council is blocked by a veto, for example. 
The Human Rights Council also agrees resolutions, but in addition, it reviews the human rights records of all UN member states on a rolling basis. It can appoint independent experts that monitor and uh, particular human rights situations or issues, and it can authorize commissions of inquiry or fact-finding missions which produce evidence about human rights violations. The Human Rights Council can then hold debates on the reports from such exports or missions. Now, resolutions from the General Assembly or the Human Rights Council are not binding. They are recommendations. In contrast, UN Security Council resolutions are binding on all member states. I mean, we can talk about the extent to which something is binding in international relations in the first place in the Q&A. But formally, under the UN Charter, Security Council resolutions are binding, and UNGA and HRC resolutions are not. But UNGA and HRC resolutions express the will of member states and can create or strengthen expectations of state behavior, that is, norms. UN resolutions are one measure of the robustness of existing norms meaning the extent of support or opposition to norms, such as the non-use of force, the responsibility to protect civilians, and so on. They signal what the international community is concerned about and can so help to drive policy agendas. Now, some, perhaps many, have derided the General Assembly as a talking shop. Much talk, blah, 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 but without much consequence. A resolution on its own cannot spark behavioral change, the critics will say. Other critics will say the debates are really only for show back home. It's all about domestic politics. And certainly there is some of what uh, Thomas Weiss has called theater at the General Assembly and the Human Rights Council. But debates are more often serious debates about principles and norms and values, even if we may not agree with them. And states are staking out principled positions and seeking the approval for those positions by a majority of other member states. So words in that sense do matter and may in fact prompt change if states feel vulnerable to being isolated or shamed or if pressure builds on them to change from their own domestic soci civil society, which could then cite UN opinion to put pressure on the member states. And states are at least obliged to justify their stances when they are, in fact, the subject of uh, resolutions. Now, this is not to argue that a UN resolution can bring violence or human rights violations to a halt, but that resolutions, the expressed will of the vast majority of member states, do form part of a process that tries to effect change in international relations. Further, and perhaps more importantly, UN resolutions are important because states seem to think that they are, full stop. They care about them. They do not wish to be singled out for criticism in a resolution, and they can devote an awful lot of di diplomatic time and attention to avoiding being singled out in a resolution. Or they can devote a lot of diplomatic time and attention to have their own position validated by other states. So these bodies, therefore, are the site of collective legitimization in which norms are generated and positions are legitimized. And here I refer in particular to an argument presented by Ines Claude way back in 1966, but it still holds true now. Politics, as he argued, is, quote, not merely a struggle for power, but also a contest over legitimacy, unquote. And the UN is probably the world's premier site of contestation in that respect. It is regarded and used, quote, as a dispenser of politically significant approval and disapproval of the claims, policies, and actions of states, including, but going far beyond, their claims to status as independent members of the international system, unquote. So he described this as a process of collect collective legitimization at the UN, principally the General Assembly, but also the Security Council. So he argued state representatives are, quote, keenly conscious, conscious of the need for approval by as large and impressive a body of other states as may be possible for multilateral endorsement of their positions, unquote. And as Paul Kennedy has more recently noted, in 20, 2007, the General Assembly is 
quote, the closest we are ever going to get to a parliament of man, unquote. It's unfortunate, rather gendered and dated te te terminology, but there we have it. But that's also, I think, one of the, <laughs> the best depictions of the Cold War uh, at the United <laughs> Nations <laughs> that, 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 you could, that you can find. <laughs> Uh, so Paul Kennedy then argued that the General Assembly is, quote, a barometer of world opinion, with its autumnal sessions in New York being like the equivalent of a town hall meeting, unquote. So for Claude and Kennedy, the importance of the UN is apparent because states clearly attach importance to winning resolutions that they sponsor or like, or blocking those they disapprove of in the General Assembly, and I would add also the Human Rights Council. Now, the process of collective legitimization is not quite the same as states or elites or people's views of the legitimacy of international institutions, that is, on whether they are worthy of respect, on which there is a considerable and growing body of academic literature, and I'm not going to go into it here. But collective legitimization implies that states do view the United Nations as legitimate enough in and of itself because they view it as a legitimate forum. Otherwise, they would not view it as worth the bother. And so they seek to use the UN as a forum to legitimize their positions and views. And one indication of the, of the importance that states give to the UN is the universality of diplomatic representation at the UN in New York. All states have a mission to the UN in New York, every single uh, one of them, and near universality of representation even in Geneva. And the size of the P5 missions, I mean, the US size is pretty impressive. That's just in New York. Um, uh, indicates that they attribute uh, importance to the United Nations, but even the smallest states have missions in New York, however small. So Andorra's, I just started at the beginning of the alphabet in the blue book. You can go find the ones at the end of the alphabet. Andorra's, there's three people in the mission, and in Barbados, there's four in their uh, missions. I think the, the role of the small states here I want to emphasize in particular. Small states cannot afford to have embassies all over the world, so they carefully decide where they should spend their few resources by maintaining embassies or permanent missions. So Andorra, population approximately 80,000, has eight embassies abroad, three of which are permanent representations to international organizations, either the UN in Geneva, the Council of Europe, and the UN in New York which doubles up as their embassy to the United States. Barbados, population approximately 280,000, has a few more embassies, 14, two of which are missions to the UN in New York and Geneva. The borough of London in which I live, Lewisham, has more than 280,000 people living in it. So just to give you an idea of the size, the relative size of the countries that we're talking about. So the UN is the place to be for all states. Why? Because this is where the important debates are taking place. And for small and medium states, international institutions provide a way for them to try to influence outcomes in international relations. So I'm now just going to show you a few examples of the process of collective legitimization to try to illustrate the argument. In October last month, the General Assembly held one of those emergency special sessions that it can do when the UN Security Council is blocked by a veto. And that was on the Israeli-Gaza uh, uh, war. And the resolution debated called for humanitarian truce and for all parties to comply with their obligations under international humanitarian law. But it did not unequivocally condemn the Hamas attack on Israel on 7th of October. And so therefore, it was a controversial resolution. But therefore, we look at the voting uh, records. We study the voting records to see where public opinion stands. Where are various states positioning themselves? Are they firmly on the yes side or on the no side or, or uh, in between and preferring to abstain, to stay out of the tense divisions prompted by uh, the conflict? The voting record can also show us divisions within the West and the European Union. A particular interest of mine, the EU on this particular vote split three ways. That is, some member states voted yes, some member states voted no, and some member states uh, voted um, to abstain. So the EU was completely and utterly divided on this particular case. But where else would we learn 
where states stand, but in voting records of the UN General Assembly. Another example comes from an, another war. And we can see the process of collective legitimization in examples from the General Assembly and the Human Rights Council's debates on Ukraine. And Ukrainian President Zelensky has certainly grasped now, perhaps not initially, the importance of trying to convince UN member states of the illegality of the Russian invasion and to condemn it, and with some uh, success. This is the voting record of a resolution in March 2022, which condemned uh, the Russian in, uh, aggression and demanded a full withdrawal of Russian forces from Ukraine. Again, to gauge where international public opinion stands, we have no better where place to look than the voting uh, records on UN General Assembly uh, resolutions. The debates about Russia's invasion also took place in the Human Rights Council, and in March 2022, the Human Rights Council passed a resolution on the human rights situation in Ukraine, uh, which again called for Russia to end human rights violations in Ukraine and withdraw from the country. And th these results, too, provide us another sh a snapshot of global public opinion, just of the 47 members of the Human Rights Council, where it stood at least in March 2022. The use and utility of the UN for collective legitimization has been noted more recently by China. Over the past few years, China has been considerably more active at the UN than it had previously been. It has devoted attention, resources, and energy to promoting its own views of global governance, governance such as, for example, on the need for the international human rights regime to be respectful of national sovereignty, so effectively human rights do not get trumped uh, by national, uh, national sovereignty trumps human rights. And it has worked assiduously to block any potential criticism of its own human rights record at the United uh, Nations Human Rights Council in particular. Now, its influence is not without uh, detractors, however, an indication that greater activity can also prompt greater scrutiny and a uh, critique. Now, a recent example of China's more muscular diplomacy at the United Nations came in October 2022, almost a year ago, when at the HRC, a resolution calling for a debate on the human rights situation in the Uyghur region in China was introduced. It was done by United States, possibly, in fact, to get the voting record on, you know, demonstrated on this particular issue. So the U.S. was the lead uh, sponsor of this particular uh, resolution, joined by a few other uh, Western uh, countries, principally Australia, Canada, the U.K., and a group of Nordic uh, countries. Now, the resolution was defeated in a vote, so, but because there were 19 against and only 17 in favor. This was actually in line with past attempts to discuss Chinese human rights at the United Nations in the 1990s, when none of the resolutions that were introduced then at what was called the UN, human, UN Commission on Human Rights well, passed either, as a majority of states supported what were called no-action motions and ended debate on them. Now, with respect to this particular resolution, the Chinese ambassador in Geneva denounced it um, as an attempt to censure China and argued that the U.S. was indulging in finger-pointing at others rather than addressing its own serious human rights violations. But what's important is that China actually took this seriously. In other words, it didn't think, oh, it's just a resolution of the Human Rights Council. Who cares what they think about our human rights records? It, it takes it seriously enough to try to lobby against it and actually do a little bit more than lobby, you know, exercising a bit of le economic leverage also to make the vote go uh, its way. Even so, it was a relatively close uh, vote, a surprisingly uh, close vote. And there has been much more criticism of China's human rights record in the Human Rights Council in terms of critical mentions and speeches of delegates in debates. And as the previous slide showed, that Lowy Institute study that I referred to, there have been doubts about effect, how effective Chinese, the, this Chinese diplomatic arm twisting has been at the UN. But the point here is that it engages in diplomatic arm twisting at the United Nations because collective legitimization is considered to be very important. So even large powers clearly take the UN seriously enough to try to push for or block resolutions.
They devote diplomatic time and attention to this, which is a sign of the UN's relevance. The collective legitimization uh, illustrates most vividly that small and middle powers count. The middle powers is a very Cold War term, which referred to primarily countries such as Ireland or the Nordic countries during the Cold War, who were desperately trying to make the UN work in the face of sort of superpower um, uh, pushback. Uh, and my colleague again, Katie Latikainen, has written on the, their role in uh, UN. So small and medium powers count um, in uh, the UN. It is their approval, after all, that is needed for legitimization. And many of them actually probably don't want to be drawn into sort of geopolitical clashes between the powers at, at the UN. And many of them want a stronger reformed and more effective uh, UN. And that is the vast majority of the UN uh, membership. So observers should also take note that states, and especially small and medial, middle powers, do not operate individually on a national basis. And this is the work that Judith was referring to uh, before. So the UN is the forum in which states uh, engage, but the outcome of those debates are often crafted through agreements that are reached in group, through group dynamics. So, for example, in, and in fact, Katie Latikainen and I argued about this in our co-edited book, political groups at the UN include the G77, so the group of, well, it's no longer 70, only 77 developing countries, it's considerably more, or through formal regional groups such as the group of Latin American and Caribbean uh, countries, through regional organizations such as the United, uh, the European Union or the African uh, Union as well as informal groups known as the Friends Of. There are loads of Friends Of uh, at the UN, for example, the Friends of the Responsibility to Protect, or similar type groups. For example, there's recently been a group called Feminist Foreign Policy Plus Group uh, formed uh, in New York. So these groups that are formed of states, some of which are quite settled, such that they're organizations in and of themselves, the EU or the, United, or the African uh, Union, that through those groups, states push for certain resolutions or positions or to gather support. Because if you go to the United Nations, you say, we already have the G77 behind us, or we already have the African Union behind us. Already, you've done quite a bit of the collective legitimization right then and there. So states work through groups to, co to craft these collectively agreed views, and thus they enable states to avoid isolation and to magnify their influence within the UN because group positions signal that there is already a body of support for these views. Most UN member states are active in one or more and frequently multiple groups. Um, in fact, the only states that tend not to be active in groups are the United States, China, and Russia. But even they still do participate in or try to lead more informal groups such as USCANs, which is Japan, United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, or the so-called like-minded group, which is led by Russia and China. And you can imagine they are like-minded in terms of pressing for sovereigntist-type positions on things like human rights. Now, groups can contribute to polarization in debates. Right? In, in fact, when the United States left the human, for the first time, it has left twice and returned twice to the Human Rights Council, but when the, human, the United States left the Human Rights Council for the first time, the EU, everybody looked to the European Union to try to push through positions on human rights. And immediately, they were contrasted by other fixed groups, such as the Organization for Islamic uh, Cooperation or the Africa Group. And so you, you often would get in debates you kind of, these strong positions held by these very powerful groups uh, kind of facing off at each other. So group politics can lead to polarization. But group membership is also quite fluid. And there is a lot of cross-regional coalition building in those friends of groups, for example, or even more informally. And this is certainly seen as critical for success in the HRC. So what's here is just um, the, an example of the, speak, the who gave oral statements just in this one particular debate at the Human uh, Rights uh, Council in one particular session. 
Um, and other debates are going to have a, you know, different lists of whoever spoke. Well, you can immediately see that groups play a big role. You've got the European Union, which in fact speaks on, on virtually 100% of every, anything that is discussed at the Human Rights Council. You have Norway on behalf of the so-called NB8, the Nordic Baltic Group of Eight Countries. In fact, they increasingly almost speak on every single um, issue at the, um, at the uh, Human Rights Council. Then you have the Gulf Cooperation Council, and often you will have a group of Arab states which either operates as the Gulf co under so the Gulf Cooperation Council or the OIC or the Arab group, right? Uh, and then you have uh, one of these examples of, of a kind of um, uh, informal uh, group, uh, this sort of the core group on Sri Lanka, which was led uh, by uh, the United uh, Kingdom. But this, again, can be repeated in every single debate on every single issue at the Human Rights Council and at the General uh, Assembly. So groups matter in these uh, debates in trying to achieve collective legitimization uh, at uh, the UN. So to sum up, the UN reflects the state of international relations. I mean, there is no sense in complaining about whether the UN is effective or not when if the P5 can't agree. Uh, for example, because it's not designed to go above the P5, right? That is, it is, in fact, the sum of its member states. So tensions between uh, the P5 block can block the UN Security uh, Council, and it has always been this way. But the UN is still relevant. It is the forum in which the politics of multilateralism unfolds. The diplomatic efforts of states to influence debates and outcomes illustrate that the UN is relevant as a site of collective legitimization. Most states use groups to try to maximize influence on outcomes, and observers, us, we need to pay attention to these political processes in order to understand the diplomacy that takes place within UN intergovernmental bodies. Paying attention to the UN as a site of collective legitimization can give us a measure of what the international community, what its views are on particular issues, and what is important to vast numbers of member states. And this is to be celebrated. We need global debates on global challenges. Further, without knowing where international political opinion falls, we are unprepared for backlash against policies and norms we may value, and we may feel, fail to see why policies such as sanctions may be ineffective because they are not supported. There is no other global forum that can match the UN in terms of universality and accessibility, that is, by all states, no matter how small. Um, collective problems need collective solutions, which entails collective legitimization. So I would argue, finally, that paying attention to that process of legitimization shows the continuing relevance of the UN, no matter the angst about effectiveness and, and so on that we have seen, well, since it was founded, <laughs> since the middle of the 1940s. So yes, the UN is still relevant today. And I'll end there. Oh, I wasn't supposed to go to that one yet. Okay, um, I'm going to very kindly help uh, Karen to take some questions. It's always part of the Karen lectures that we have questions from the audience. So um, could you please put your hand up and I'll try to get to you and just keep waving if I don't manage to. Gentleman in the blue jumper. Sorry. Uh, first of all, can I thank you very much for a very illuminating lecture. Um, my question is with your ear to the UN door, have you heard a single reason to justify Russia's invasion of Ukraine? And if you haven't, why do you think they did it? <laughs> I mean, yeah, you know, uh, I mean, on that one, I think Putin has expressed a number of opinions on why he's, he's invaded uh, uh, Ukraine, which uh, essentially because it's not a sovereign uh, country. But uh, no, the, but, I mean, I could go back to the slide on that vote, go back through all of this stuff. I mean, that is a lot of countries that aren't buying 
the Russian justification. And if you look at the number of against, so a lot of countries don't like, keep us out of it. 35 are just like, we'd really rather not be in this kind of debate. But only five, right? So of true allies to, the, to Russia, only five countries, well, including Russia, right, oppose, um, oppose this particular resolution. So Russia does not have a lot of friends, right, in the, in, in, at the younger, at least in this particular moment in time on this particular issue. So in other words, if one, so one, I, from a collective legitimization perspective, it does not have collective legitimacy to invade Ukraine. Now, is that going to stop the invasion? No, but it does kind of set a marker on what the international will is, which is no. This don't, right? Um, and so you could say, that, well, then but Russia was going to do it anyway and all the rest of it, but that's not, that's not so the, the point of the UN is to say, well, but we disapprove, right? And, um, and over the long term, that can eat away. I mean, you know, that, that um, going then to somewhere and saying, well, we have legitimacy to do this isn't going to fly in the, in the, in, you know, in the face of this sort of, of declaration of, no, actually, it isn't legitimate, right? And that's about as much as you can do, really, unless you're then going to use military force. I mean, you know, and the, so the, the point of the UN is also to have a debate about these sorts of things, to do that, to express this kind of collective, collective will. When it's a P5 member, there's very little you can do anyway, right? I mean, you can't, it's just impossible. Um, uh, but, the, but the point is, you, first of all, Russia trying to justify it, no one's buying it, right? Um, and, you know, and that eventually then can create sort of, can create space for a bit of, of change, of, um, of uh, contestation um, from perhaps even friends of, of Russia who say, you know. I mean, certainly that's, you could say that's happening to a certain extent with Israel. Lady with a scarf. <laughs> Yeah. Do you want to take two? So yeah. I also have a question related to Russia. <laughs> um, so a couple of years ago, the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, the UK, um, did an um, investigation, did a report on the influence of totalitarian regimes on the UK higher education sector. And there was a lot of evidence around China and there was some evidence around Russia. And one of the points that was made in by one of the people giving evidence was that China likes to get into systems and organizations and change them from within, whereas Russia doesn't, you know, Russia stays on the outside and likes to change them from outside. So I think from some of the evidence you gave in your presentation, um, there's, that is China, you demonstrated where China has got into the United Nations and is using instruments within the United Nations for its own end, right? And I suppose in the way you kind of said, well, look, no one's really with Russia, so there's the Russians on the outside. Is there any other, you know, can you give us another example of where you think Russia has, if you agree with what, what, what I've said, that, that Russia often sits on the outside and tries to change organizations from without? I wouldn't say completely from without, but I would argue that, of course, the United States and Western countries also try to change yeah. the organizations from within. I mean, that, you know, that's part of, part of the problem, in fact, of some of the developing countries saying this, these things are completely, I mean, you've been, you know, you've been running the show for ages. Um, um, uh, and China sort of only, I think, at least from what I understand, China kind of, because, of course, China, the, the China that we know was not, in fact, a member of the United Nations for many years, right? So it was outside, it was an outsider in the first place, okay? Um, because Taiwan was the representative on the security, you know, what we call Taiwan was the representative on the Security Council. Um, so then that changed, I guess, you know, a little bit of quietism. But now there's a, they, they have kind of woken up to the fact that you, you can... In a way, this is what the United States did after World War II. We are going to, we, we have hegemony. We, we are the hegemon, but we're not going to exercise it as some sort of brute power. We're going to do so via 
the, the framework of multilateral institutions. I mean, that was the US view in the 1940s. And so China now is like, oh, well, yes, <laughs> actually, let's, you know, we can do that as well. At least that's my understanding. I mean, I'm not an expert on Chinese foreign policy, but that's my understanding of how China now is viewing the international institution. Russia, of course, I think is, is probably much more of an outsider in the sense that perhaps it doesn't it's, I mean, I, I, I hesitate to say this, but it's also a bit of a, shall we say, declining power. And um, it could then try to mask the decline in its power by using international institutions, but it, it's, that's not where its foreign policy uh, is. Um, but uh, changing it from the outside, I'm not sure. Acting regardless, yes. Right, which I don't think is the, the same thing as changing it from, from within. Whereas China certainly seems to be trying to actually uh, exercise the influence from within the multilateral institutions, including the United Nations. Anyhow. Okay, gentleman at the front here. Sorry, needs to please come down. <clears throat> yes, thank you very much. My name is John Dobson. Um, um, I'd like to ask you a question about the makeup of the P5. Um, for my sins, I write, I have a weekly column in a newspaper called The Sunday Guardian, which is published in New Delhi and in many parts of India. And through that, I read it, of course, my own column, but also <laughs> other people's. Um, and I'm very much aware of the grievance in India, uh, now, which is now the biggest country in the world by population, um, the grievance that they have about not being within the P5. And I, we all know how it was made up, of course, in the first place. But do you not think that the UN would be more relevant if the P5 were to be more representative? Um, and do you think it's possible, or would it be a case of Turkey's voting for Christmas? <laughs> I mean, I think, I think the UN is relevant. I don't think there's a case of making it more relevant. Um, uh, the question of uh, Security Council reform expansion is a thorny one, obviously, which is why it hasn't been resolved for, what, 75, going on 80 years. Um, because the question, you know, has arisen basically since the, also since just the end of the Cold War. I mean, my question would be, okay, you expand it and it's more representative. Is it more effective? No, it would be less effective, I would argue, if, if India had a veto, because you've expanded veto players what we call veto players. You expand the number of veto players, you expand the possible vetoes that can be, can be imposed, and you're, you know. Um, and, uh, I mean, for example, in the, the European Union, the veto players on foreign policy are 27, right? I mean, that's a lot of veto players, and no wonder you get blockages. Um, so just by expand, and maybe more, rep but is, so the, there's a trade-off between representation and efficiency if you, by, putting India on the Security Council, you also give India a veto, right? Um, if you, you create, I mean, you know, there have been so many formulations for UN Security Council over the decades, kinds of tiers of membership and this, you know, very de varying degrees of power of the various tiers of membership. Um, you know, would India want to be on the permanent five without a veto? I mean, on the Security Council without a, permanently without a veto? But, but my, my point would just be that just by adding the representation, you don't necessarily make it efficient. And if it's not efficient and effective, then <laughs> what are you getting out of it? But this is why it hasn't been solved, why the thorny problem with Security Council reform hasn't been solved. I mean, you could take the position, actually, that there should only be three on the P5. And Russia's place on the P5 is dubious, right? So you could take, but there's actually only two countries that count, and that's the United States and China. And the rest are just kind of floating around. Um, you know, but we've got the five, you know, you're actually pretty close to a distribution of wealth and a distribution of nuclear power right now um, as, as it stands. But I just think it's the trade-off between representation and expanding the veto guys that makes it, it, makes it a very... It's not just a clear-cut 
kind of thing. Yes, it's going to be an un unalloyed good if we expand the number of veto players, because actually expanding the number of veto players might not be an unalloyed good. Um, it would certainly keep more... Do you think it could ever happen? Do you think it could ever happen, Karen? That's the other um, I mean, I doubt it. I doubt it. It's like I tell my students, I don't think I'm going to be alive when there's an EU seat on the Security Council, by which I mean that there would be a common, uh, that there would be a single foreign policy on behalf of the EU. Right? I don't think I will be alive, even though the European Parliament asks almost every year for a single, an EU seat on the Security Council. I think that's probably too, I know, you know, you, you, yeah, I just think that the knots that have, to, you know, that's just, I mean, I, I, so therefore, you're in the position of trying to make the best of what you have, of how to work with what you have. And that could be that India gets, you know, two five-year terms, or India and Brazil and, you know, all the other countries that claim to have a, that kind of thing. But every time you mention, you know, Brazil, Argentina is like, a, or Chile is, why Brazil? And, you know, so, yeah, the knots that would have to be undone. So I have a feeling that it, I won't see it. So. <laughs> okay. Other questions? Uh, gentleman over there. Richard. And then I'll come to the lady in front. Thank you very much for a resume of, uh, I would say, the objective view of the committees and the votes and things. I'm intrigued to know how much lobbying goes on and, and whether for 360 days of the year, they sort of work out what, the, what line they're going to take. And then suddenly, on the day of the vote, they rush in and uh, over a glass of coffee or a drink or two, they suddenly say, no, let's do this. Is there much lobbying? Does it go on for every day of the year, or is it? Uh, yes. <laughs> lobbying goes on all the time at the UN, certainly both in New York during the General Assembly, but also in the lead-up to the General Assembly and certainly at the Human Rights Council, which is virtually in permanent session because it's meeting three times a, a year in, in Geneva. Um, so there's constant, um, there, you know, in, in the human rights field, there's constant uh, pressure or uh, attempts to influence Human Rights Council or General Assembly Third Committee debates on human rights all the time, all the time. But the other part of your question is on whether or not, do you mean whether states like faff around having coffee and then they walk in the room and they decide whether or not there's gonna, the delegate's going to vote yes or no? No. I, th th these, I mean, most of the time, most of the time they already know, but that has been worked out through these, for example, through that group politics those group dynamics that I mentioned before. These things are worked out in these kind of discussions. Um, so it's not as though you walk into the room, you hear a really convincing, persuasive debate by somebody, and you suddenly change your vote, also because they're getting instructions from, from, from capitals uh, quite a few, uh, quite a lot of the time. They may have specific instructions to vote in particular uh, ways. But all of that is not decided on, on the day. It's, but it, it is done in this um, almost constant process of negotiation and meetings um, that kind of reach a, a, a fever point during the moment in which the General Assembly is meeting or in which the Human Rights Council is meeting. And we, that, you know, the activity um, that goes on on any particular day of these meetings is, is intense. Um, but, it's, but it is also year-round. It is year-round. And sometimes it doesn't necessarily happen in New York or in Geneva. It can happen in the capitals because, because uh, a, a delegation will call their capital. You need to put pressure on X, and so that it will be capital to capital lobbying and, uh, and negotiation to see if they can change uh, votes. But all of that is happening very much before the moment in which they walk into the, into the room. Thank you. I mean, uh, she was, just uh, before you finish that one, uh, one of your view graphs had a picture of the 47 countries voted and out of 140 attended. One, one of your human resources one, that, that one, I think, 30, yeah, about 47. This is there, 47 right? in the Human Rights yeah, Council. Yeah, where are the other 140? Or no, whatever There's, it is. Because the Human Rights Council only has 47 member states that are elected from five regional groups by the General Assembly. 
So it is a reduced, like the Security Council, the 10 um, uh, rotating members of the Security Council also voted by the General Assembly. Similarly, the Human Rights Council members are voted by the General Assembly. This year, in fact, just, just recently, Russia w w uh, ran for a seat but was um, rejected by the General Assembly. In a very, un usually the seats are not contested for the Human Rights Council, but this was an occasion in which they were, and the General Assembly voted against Russia. I mean, just to add a practical note, what tends to happen is that ambassadors around the world are asked to go in and lobby in their capitals to make sure the message gets back to, to New York. And sometimes it doesn't get back to New York, and you have to keep going backwards and forwards. And you don't change your mind over a cup of coffee, but things go up to the wire, particularly whether you're going to abstain or vote against. That's the difficult one. If you're going to vote for, that's agreed quite a long time in advance, mm. usually. I mean, th this... Where's that? This one will have been something that couldn't have been months in advance, obviously, because this is a this is a live, you know, ongoing situation, um, uh, and will have generated some. I mean, the most one of the most famous ones was when Germany abstained in the Security Council on the um, responsibility to protect in Libya, um, going against the UK and France. That was a, that was one where then then everything blew up because of that particular vote. Yeah. Lady in front, yes, if you could pass the, thank you. the mic down. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. It's been a fascinating insight uh, into how it really works and uh, looking away from the P5. Um, and just, you know, to think on it, I mean, Germany, it didn't really make much difference about what happened in Libya in the end, did it? And I wonder, my question is, how do you see the UN response working out in the case of Gaza and Israel? Because it looks like the P5 have to be in charge of what comes next, but you're saying that the influence could lie in other places. Oh, well, mm -hmm. I mean, Israel, I mean, um, the, the UN will, I would predict that the UN will have to be involved in the aftermath, simply because of the legitimacy of the UN as a global, you know, collective legitimizer, but also as an actor I mean, uh, the UN, of course, was one of the members of, of when we, there used to be something called the Middle East Peace Process. There were four key actors, the US, EU, uh, Russia, and, uh, and the UN. Uh, so the UN has always been there. Um, uh, so I would predict the UN in some way, shape, or form will be involved on, in, on the ground. If you can reach some sort of agreement between Israel and Palestine and then all of the neighbors, you almost automatically have P5 agreement. Because once, you know, if there's some sort of thing that is, for, that is coming up from the ground and all those sort of diplomatic negotiations that are on, ongoing, then, I mean, China, China's not going to, that's not going to be something that China would veto. And probably Russia wouldn't veto it if you somehow managed to drag Iran along uh, as well. So you would, you could end up with some kind of P5 agreement, but that would not, but that won't be top down. That would have come from whatever's, whatever all the diplomatic stuff that's going on right now, it will, it will arise from there as one possible element of a solution to this horrific problem. There's also the United, let's not forget that there's the UN. So I would kind of predict that at some point, probably not soon enough, but at some point the UN will be one element of some sort of, not solution, but some sort of response on the ground, um, but probably not very soon. Thank you very much. Other questions? Gentlemen there, and then one at the very back. Good evening, Professor Karen. Thank you very much indeed uh, for a really insightful lecture. Um, if emboldening uh, the UN is our desire, what advice would you, would you give our new foreign secretary? Look at this. Look at this, right? And pay attention to the arguments that are, I mean, engage. Engage. I mean, I, I, I think most of the time they do, um, but there can be a certain element of assuming that you've already sold the picture. Um, and, uh, and perhaps not picking up enough 
on some of the queries that might be coming. I mean, I'm speaking just because of what I know is sometimes how the EU has behaved, for example, in the Human Rights Council. This is when the UK was a member of the EU, by the way, uh, in terms of sort of just sort of, you know, but our position is obviously the, you know, the one that everybody should go along with without then engaging in, well, let's, you know, at least be modest <laughs> about it. So my, I would pay attention, engage in this, and engage, I mean, the, the topics are difficult, some of them. I mean, if you want to talk about, for example, climate change in the context of the UN or human rights and climate change, um, I mean, frequently Western countries want to talk about, just this is the case of human rights and climate change. Western countries will want to talk about whether or not governments are, um, are, are uh, um, complying with human rights obligations while they are fighting climate change. Or, or you know, that there's, there's something about governments, the others, other governments, and what they're doing to protect human rights while they're also combating climate change. Developing countries are like, oh, <laughs> Uh, we're burning or we're drowning here or we're literally, we need somewhere else to hold our country because, because we're going to be underwater. And they want to talk about money. And they want to talk about what are you going to do to make sure that we're not going to go under or that we have enough resources to try to climatize to, you know, and so on and so forth. Those are very, because then the West doesn't want to open its pocketbooks. But you have to listen to those kinds of arguments and figure out then, okay, well, wh well where is a landing point here. Um, or let's talk about reparations for, for slavery. And you know, this came up recently, apologizing, making those kind of apologies. And, and that particular issue, the reparations and racism and whatnot, has been, in fact, a very live issue at the Human Rights uh, Council. But you've got to listen to it, and you have to engage with it. Otherwise, you've, lo you've lost the room immediately. And you've, in a way, almost contributed, I think, to some of the polarization that you can, that you can see. Um, so it is, I mean, I would kind of recommend for that middle power way, which is trying to, I mean, politics is the art of compromise, you know, trying to find that sort of, um, those landing points with some humility. And, you know, having studied some of the EU stuff in the UN, sometimes humility is not always as evident as it should be. So. <laughs> Gentlemen, right at the very back, um... Sorry. <laughs> Toss it back. <laughs> it was more of a general point I wanted to make in terms of the overall disappointment with the effectiveness of the UN. Um, it's almost as if its relevance is irrelevant because it's not going to be disbanded, is it? And there is no alternative. But I wondered, um, were we naive in uh, hoping for better in the original concept when the UN was set up? And do you feel there is any likelihood it's going to change? Actually, I don't think it was naivety at, at, at all. In fact, I thought it was, it was hard-headed realist calculations that we're not going to repeat the mistakes of the League of Nations, which might have been too idealistic. We are going to have all of the great powers sit at the same uh, uh, table. And that is the reality, is that we have this situation in which we want to make sure great powers are in the room, and therefore we give them a veto power. I think it was actually much more hard-headed realist calculation in that, right? Um, and so I don't think that it was naive. And institutions could die. In fact, I don't know if anybody's been, I mean, why would you? But, I mean, following the, the news about the Organization for Security and, and Cooperation in Europe, that could, in fact, be on its last uh, death throes because of Russia, uh, because you can't get ar around the unanimity bit in, in, in the OSCE, and the OSCE is sort of, I mean, I could have put, you know, is it, is it relevant uh, there? But that's one in which is, there's serious questions about it. Um, so institutions don't always last. Western European Union, my personal favorite of one that, that died, I don't know. Again, why should you know about the Western European Union? Um, you know, but so there can be, the, the UN will never not be irrelevant, but that, you know, it is realistic, I think. And maybe, I mean, a former colleague of mine, Christopher Hill at the LSC, went to, who then uh, went to Cambridge, wrote a famous article, about, oh, in the early 1990s, about what he called the capabilities expectations gap with respect to the EU in international affairs. And what he argued was that, there is a gap, well, he said, there's a gap between what the EU can, has the capabilities to do, 
and the expectations that are on it. That gap can be narrowed by increasing the capabilities or by reducing the expectations, right? Um, and, you know, so being more, much more realistic. And so I think some of the times that we think about the UN, also what do we mean by effective? Um, and my argument would be sometimes, at least in the Western commentariat, is they aren't doing what we want them to do whereas they actually <laughs> might be fairly effective from another, you know, another point of view. And that doesn't make that other point of view less valid. That, you know, so I think actually that the formation of the United Nations was actually quite realist in, um, in its origin. And uh, it, most of the time, there was complete realism about what we could expect from the P5. I think the heyday of the early 1990s then, <laughs> Like, all of a sudden, we saw, well, what could happen if the P5 agree? But that was short-lived, you know? I mean, there are still, I mean, the, the P5 did just recently, just the other day, agree on a, uh, to, to, to approve um, uh, somebody else going into Haiti. <laughs> not, the, not the United, not the UN, but somebody else doing that. But they agreed, you know, so they still can, can come to an agreement. Um, but no, I think, um, I think uh, Roosevelt and company were extremely realist when they were thinking about setting up the UN. I'm conscious that uh, we're keeping everybody from a drink um, <laughs> and that Karen has asked a lot of, answered a lot of questions very well. Are there any other questions burningly on different areas? Can I just ask one then? Um, <laughs> I was thinking of the comment at the back, really, about sort of, you know, the, the, the thinking at the beginning. In a world where, you know, Google, Facebook, <laughs> and all the rest of it have such a sort of, and we're worried about disinformation, artificial intelligence, about things that are not necessarily, sometimes they're state-driven, but actually they're sometimes being organized by other mm -hmm. actors. Mm -hmm. We have World Economic Forum, we have P40 and all that. Do you think... One of the real challenges to the UN, in a way, with all the governments sitting and chatting, is that, as it were, real life is acting in an international way outside the United Nations. Oh, yeah, but I would say there's always been. I mean, there right. have been loads of things that have happened that, that way. Can the UN respond to that? Well, or? then, well, where else are we going to get a response, in a way? Mm -hmm. If it's going to be a global response to this, what I consider to be a threat from uh, these tech bros, um, I mean, I... I yeah, the only way, I think, is via international institutions, I mean, not only, but including the, Europe, the, the United Nations. Because it's, it's to make it durable, to make it, to, in a sense, legalize it over time, you know, then, then, you, need, then you would need the UN. But, it's, but in a way, the UN is always going to be responding to things that have been... Outside influences. Uh, that, that's, that yeah. the outside influences. You know, I mean, it does. It, as I said, it has generated these ideas, but in a way, that's also a response to, to, to events and developments that have happened, have happened uh, elsewhere. Um, but yeah, that, okay. uh, let's hope they can. Well, look, can I just invite everybody to give Karen a really big thank you for a great lesson and great answers. Thank you. <laughs> I think some parish notices are coming along. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a slightly high-risk endeavour. I've just switched on another piece of microphone equipment, which appears to be working. Is it? Good. Um, Karen, thanks so much for that. I'm always the, the, almost the first thing I ever say to a visitor when they arrive, a speaker, is thank you very much for coming to Devon, because this is a bit of a struggle to get people of the caliber of you, of you to come here and give this sort of lecture in what is deemed to be somehow the far southwest. So first off, thank you very much for doing that. Secondly, thanks for a great tour de force. I was coming here ready to be pretty cynical. I am leaving mildly reassured, I think is the best description to reflect my feelings at this moment. And I'm mildly reassured by the clarity of what you have to say. Um, I do worry about populism and the rise of populism and the effect that may have. I think you're absolutely right on the visionary, realistic uh, establishment of the, of the UN. But it was, uh, it, was a, it was a great lecture, really enjoyed it, and thanks so much for taking so many, so many questions. 
And at this point, I step behind him and hope there's a box. I won't show you the awfully smart back. There's a small you can see in the character lecture we we do not you know <laughs> bring that, bring that, bring that came out of the hill household um, could I also pass on our thanks to the vice chancellor who's left not because she was not mesmerised by what you had to say but she had a as an urgent practical issue at home, which she needs to resolve. I'd like to thank her team, Alison, who was scuttling around with the, uh, with the microphone. Uh, they are tremendously helpful and make my life a heck of a lot easier. Bear in mind that Karen's chosen charity was taken over from the RNLI, which of our last two speakers is actually cancer research, and I shall be making a donation to that tomorrow. Um, thank you all for coming here tonight uh, and for your continuing support for this august body, the uh, Carradine Lectures Trust. Just bear in mind that I am not immortal. Neither are most of your trustees. So we're always looking for a new blood so if anybody's keen do stick their hand up please a few parish notices okay in 2024 we're going to give you a bumper deal we hope in that in the spring we'll be asking Zainab Badawi to have a conversation with us and what that's a euphemism for is that she's not actually going to be here she's going to be in London but rather, as we did for Kim Darrick two years ago, we'll do the whole thing online. You will be able to submit questions in advance, and we'll have questions coming up throughout the whole thing. For those of you who don't know who Zainab is, she was born in the Sudan. She's a well-known political journalist on ITV Channel 4 and the BBC. Currently, she's president of the School of African and Oriental Studies at the University of London. Uh, and her first book, An African History of Africa, has been announced for publication in April 2024. So no prizes for guessing when we might do the lecture. In the autumn, we've been trying to get somebody to come and talk on the environment. And thanks to Martin Oates, we have attracted a speaker from Plymouth, who is Lewis Pugh, who gave up a life as a lawyer in order to pursue the sustaining of the environment. And he will be talking to us in the autumn. He's an old Mount House boy, for those of you who have children at Mount House. We look forward to that. As usual, we'll be holding our retiring collection. You'll find buckets on offer uh, and as you leave the auditorium. Um, in a great technical leap forward for the Carrington Lectures Trust, you will also find some QR codes. For those of you who've given up cash, we can now get your money directly into our bank account via a QR code. Finally, could I ask a few of you, and I do only mean a few of you, to complete a gift aid form, which is on the desks outside, for the very simple reason that we've always wondered why we couldn't claim the gift aid on your generous donations as you leave. So under the, under the gift aid on small donations scheme, we can do that, provided we have claimed normal gift aid in the same financial year. So we don't have to get more money out of you. We'd just like a few of you to fill out a gift aid form so I can legitimately put my hand up and say, 
we've given you X over the year, ergo we can claim 10 times, sorry, 100 times, uh, 10 times X in gift aid on small donations. So I know it's a bit of a pain, but be awfully grateful. And I'm not asking you all to do it. You know, we'll stop you when we've reached, re reached a sensible amount of money. Okay, and it is only a very small amount of money, about 80 quid, we'll, we'll do it. So thank you if you wouldn't mind doing that. Okay, thanks for coming. Um, I think there might be a glass of wine and a canopy for you outside.